Today we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'll begin as you have opened your Bibles. I'll begin by saying this is one of those passages, once again, that could take three weeks to look at. There's so much here, and it was so very difficult for me to get through this this morning. But it deals with judgment on false teachers, and you'll see that in just a moment. Let's begin looking at verse 10 and 11 here in 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll get into our study. Judgment on false teachers. The Apostle Peter writes in verse 10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Now, the Apostle Peter has illustrated that God is bringing judgment against false teachers. And as we have seen, he illustrated this by reminding his readers of three judgments that they would be familiar with. He reminded them concerning the judgment of angels, the judgment on the ancient world, and God's judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So after referring to their judgment, he now returns to the theme of false teachers, a theme that he began in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 3. And what he's doing here is he's giving more characteristics of false teachers. And that's what we'll be looking at today as the Apostle Peter begins to speak concerning a judgment on false teachers. And so the characteristics are outlined. The first thing we see in verse 10, this first characteristic is that a false teacher walks according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, he says. These false teachers live to satisfy the impulses of their carnal desires. There may be an underlying meaning of them having a sexually immoral approach to life, but they live to satisfy the, their own impulses. This is something like what Jude said in verse 4, where he says in, in his book, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. You see, false teachers do not teach the way of holiness. They will pervert what is called the grace of God. When you study your scriptures, you discover that God's grace has been given to us that we might come to a relationship with Him. The word grace speaks of God's unmerited favor. He gives to me something I don't deserve. I haven't earned it. It's called grace. And so God's grace has been given to us. But some teachers will teach that grace is really an excuse for or a license to continue in sin. False teachers very often will say, well, you're saved by grace, therefore live as you please. There's nothing you need to be aware of or concerned about. If you were saved or have come forward or claim to receive Christ in an invitation and and are a thief, you can remain a thief. What's the big deal? God's grace covers that. If you've got a violent temper, what's the big deal about that? That's just the way that you were born. If you're an alcoholic, you like to drink and all, what's wrong with that? They give you permission to continue in sin. If you're having sexual intercourse outside of marriage, it's no big deal. After all, you're engaged, therefore it's all right. And they'll teach you these things, and that's basically what the Apostle Peter is speaking about. He's saying they use the word grace to cover over licentious or behavior that has no restraint. They say that grace is sufficient, therefore, you can live as you please. We need to remember that, to God, that God's grace is intended to reduce the practice of sin, not to increase it. When the Apostle Paul was writing in, in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so Paul would argue with that. Well, the Apostle Peter is saying that. He's saying these people are false teachers and they walk according to the flesh, their flesh in, their, in the lust of their own uncleanness. These are people who believe that, that grace is really license. And he's saying that this is wrong. Not only that, but he says they despise authority. That word despise means to think little or nothing of. It speaks of disdaining something, and the word authority there would be in reference to biblical authority. They reject the rule of Jesus Christ in their life, and they reject an accountability to other people. 
If they're in error, you can't correct them. If somebody has said something that is incorrect and you approach them and say, but the Bible says this, they won't receive that correction. And so basically they despise Jesus' authority in their life and they're not accountable to anybody else. He says they are presumptuous and they're self-willed. When he says they're presumptuous and self-willed, it speaks of them being bold and arrogant. They respect no one and nothing restrains them. Because if they're not accountable to anybody, then who's going to bring them into any kind of correction? He says in verse 10 and into verse 11, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. These dignitaries he's speaking about are angelic dignitaries. He's especially speaking about Satan. And he's simply saying this, that these teachers, basically being bold and arrogant, boast even against Satan himself. They say that they're superior to him. They're greater than he. You know, I have seen on occasion when I used to watch what was called Christian TV, I have seen teachers who teach error giving stories, exaggerated stories of their victories over the devil. And I've, and I've seen them when they've gotten emotional and passionate and, and how that they speak to him and they have authority over him and all. And yet that is an interesting attitude to have because what we have here with Second Peter as well as in the book of Jude is that that isn't the attitude that we ought to be having towards these spiritual beings. He's saying that they put on great spiritual shows. They can even ignorantly be challenging Satan. But he goes on in verse 11 to say, angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation. Even the angels themselves did not do so. You can cross-reference that with the book of Jude, verses 9 and 10, because there it says, not even the chief angel Michael did this. In his quarrel with the devil, when they argued about who would have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare condemn the devil with insulting words, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people attack with insults anything they do not understand. And those things that they know by instinct, like wild animals, are the very things that destroy them. You know, I've seen these guys and they, and they speak in such a way, such a bravado, such an arrogance. And, and they tell these exaggerated tales of their spiritual conflict. And I told the devil this, and I told the devil that. Yeah, lion, snake, and then they say things like that. And, and, and sometimes, I have to be honest with you, I have wished that he would actually appear on set for a moment just to watch him run. Because that's not what you do. Michael himself, an archangel, dared not render a railing accusation, but rather said, the Lord rebuke you. It's not that... that that we have so much authority that we just trample on the head of the enemy. It's that Jesus does. And through his authority and through his power, by his name, through his blood, we have the ability to resist the enemy and he will flee from us. But the Bible doesn't tell us to render railing accusations against him, to call him names and things like that. It's extremely unwise to do that. But he goes on in verse 12 and he says, But these like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. So he speaks of these false teachers and he says they're like fierce and destructive animals. They're made to be caught and they're made to be destroyed. You see, they blaspheme what they don't understand, but they will perish in their own corruption. In other words, they reject the way of the Lord. They end up perishing in their own sins. He says that in verse 13 when he says they will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, their spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. They're going to receive the wages of unrighteousness. Their destruction is the legitimate reward of their own wrongdoing. It's like what it says in Isaiah 3.11, Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. He will reap what he has sown. He will reap that. These are people who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. It's not enough that they party at night, but they party during the day too. They're teaching you to have so much licentiousness, so much freedom to do whatever you want, that they take pleasure in, in just partying at all times by all means. Sometime in my late teens, maybe I was 20 at the time, I don't remember any longer how old I was, I do remember this. 
I remember, I remember I, as a non-saved person, as an unsaved young man, I loved to party like a lot of you in this room did. And for me, it was, it was great if a party would stretch from the night into the day. I enjoyed partying in the daytime. Carousing is what he's speaking about, but it's partying, partying in the daytime. I can still remember my dad and my mom going off on vacation. They took my two younger sisters with them. My brother Frank was in the military. So I was left alone at the house. And I do remember them taking off. And when they left, I thought it would be a great time to have a party. So, so I started calling people up. And we had a party. It lasted one day into the night, all through the night, lasted through the next day, carousing in the daytime, just like the scripture says. And I don't remember exactly how long it had gone, but it went for those two days at least. But I do remember this. I was in my parents' kitchen. And I had all these people in the house, and I had called people, more people to come to the party. And they were drunk, and they were loaded, and they were in the den, they were in the front room, they were in bedrooms, they were everywhere in the house. And I was there at the front, in the kitchen, sitting in the front of the kitchen there at, a, at the table with a friend of mine named Albert. Albert took what they call, we used to call them downers, he took some reds, and he was very loaded. And he had his face planted on his hands there. When my sister came bursting in through the side door and came running into the kitchen and she said, Dad's home and he's mad. I remember grabbing Albert and lifting him out of the chair, taking him to the front door, opening the door, and he was staggering. And I shoved him out the door, closed the door behind him. Then I'm grabbing people from the front room, yelling at get out of the rooms. And then I see the side door open up again, and it's Albert, and he comes staggering down. And I grabbed him again and threw him out a second time. He's wandering out in the front yard. And then my dad comes walking in. And my dad walks in, and he looks at me, and he said something like, you better leave or I'm going to hurt you. My dad was a sailor. He didn't say exactly that. He used sailor language. I got the point. And I remember leaving. I ran away from home. I went and got my car that he had bought, drove it across the street and parked it. It was a station wagon. So in the morning, he would leave, and he'd see me in that station wagon as he turned the corner. And I was there for several days, just laying in there. And I knew it was bothering my dad. Finally, my mom came and said, because she knew where I was. I was 50 feet away. <laughs> my mom came and said, you know, you need to come home now, son. So I had punished my father enough and I came home. But the Lord later on used that as an illustration to me because I might act as if dad won't come home, but one day he will and he will be angry if I'm not doing the right thing. And one day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be returning and he's going to come back with a flame of fire in his eyes and he will be upset at those who are not doing the right thing. I learned that even as a non-believer, that dad eventually comes at a moment you didn't expect him. These people were carousing in the daytime. They were partying 24-7. They didn't really care. They have no sense of shame. They don't care about the way that they're living. It's like what it says in Isaiah 22:13. But see, there is joy in revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat, Drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. That's the attitude that they have. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Get as much as you can out of life right now because you don't know how long it's going to last. Well, continuing, he describes them as being spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Spots speak of moral imperfection. It speaks of a moral flaw. Blemishes speaks of moral disgrace. He's saying they're disgracing the name of Christ, in their false teaching. They carouse, he says, in their own deceptions while they feast with you. They're forming opinions that give license to sin, and then they act on those opinions. And they're feasting with you. They come to the church service. They go to what is called the love feast, where a meal was presented to those in the church to enjoy together in fellowship, but they're, they're eating in an unworthy manner. In verse 14, he says, they have eyes that are full of adultery. They, they desire every woman they see. They can turn the most sacred times into opportunities to indulge in sexual sin. 
They're the kind of people that can pretend that they're Christians. They come to church not to worship God. They come to pick up on the girls. They can even do that during communion services. He says in verse 14 that they beguile unstable souls. They seduce the believers who have no solid foundation. It's a picture of an adulteress seducing an inexperienced and innocent woman. He's saying that false teachers seduce those who are immature in their faith. Verse 14, they have a heart trained in covetous practices, and they are accursed children. A heart trained in covetous practice means that they're experts in greed. They, they see religion as something you can financially profit from, but they are accursed children. When he says they're accursed children, it means God's wrath is upon them. Romans 1.18 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Yes, again, we have the grace of God, but God also is a God who has wrath. He says in verses 15 and 16, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet, Balaam. Balaam was a false prophet. He's found in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, chapters 22 into chapter 24. Great reading gives you some insight into this man. Balaam was a false prophet. But there was a king by the name of Balak who had come into the land. He had heard that Balaam was a prophet. Didn't matter to him whether he was true or whether he was false. And he came and he tried to hire him. He wanted Balaam to prophesy a curse against the children of Israel. Balaam said to Balak, I can't do that. I can only say what God would have me to say concerning Israel. Well, Balak wanted to make him a very wealthy man. So he took him out there and he said, say something. And Balaam could only prophesy blessings. It got Balak very upset. And so finally he says to him, I would have made you a wealthy man if you would have prophesied correctly. Well, in the midst of all of that, Balaam is on his donkey and he's making it, trying to make his way to go curse the children of Israel. He greatly desires to do that when the donkey presses against a wall and, and Balaam's foot is crushed between the donkey and the wall and Balaam gets really upset and he starts striking the, the animal and cursing it and the animal turns and looks at him. Why are you hitting me? He asks him. And Balaam talks to him. Haven't I been a good donkey to you all these years? Now, as you read that, Balaam's, yes, but look what you're doing. And he, he yells at him. Well, there are people who, who say, I don't believe that's possible. You ever get up in the morning and your car's outside? It's a cold, wet morning. You climb into this cold car and you start to turn the ignition, and it doesn't start. Do you ever talk to the car? You stupid car, I shouldn't have got you. I hate you. I'm trying. <laughs> Buy a battery, you know. We have cars that talk to us now, too. They tell you, turn left, turn right. Why is it a woman's voice telling us where to go? That's another thing. <laughs> we have to talk about that someday, don't we? You can get so upset that you don't even notice what's being said. God gave that animal the opportunity and the ability to say something to a, a man who is crazy. And that's basically what he's saying here. He's saying that this individual would not listen. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. And so what does he do? Well, when you study the New Testament, the New Testament reminds us or remembers him uh, for being, able, uh, being a man who was willing to do anything for money. 
Like it says in Jude 11, Woe unto them, they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. And also the Bible makes it clear that he gave advice that resulted in the children of Israel sinning sexually. What he did is this, is he told Balak, listen, God is a jealous God. He has called the nation of Israel to follow him alone. There is to be no other gods before the God of Israel. If you want these people to suffer harm, introduce them to the women of the land. Because God has said that the Israelite is to not have relations with any of the people in the land surrounding them. And as a result of that, God will be bringing judgment on them. Numbers 25, 1 through 3 says, While Israel was staying in Acacia Grove, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the, the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. In chapter 31, verse 16 of Numbers, they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened in Peor so that a plague struck the Lord's people. So, he said, they followed the way of Balaam. They have forsaken the right way, is what he is saying. Going on, he says in verse 17, these are wells without water. These are clouds carried by a tempest. These are wells that are dry. These are wells that have no true living water. You're in the middle of a dry, arid place. You're very thirsty. You see a well. You see the bucket. You drop the bucket into the, the well, and you hear it hear the bottom. There's nothing in the well that can satisfy your thirst. And that's what he's saying a false teacher does for you. A false teacher will never provide spiritual water. He cannot give to you. She cannot give to you living water. The water that you thirst is not going to come from a false prophet. He cannot give that to you. He cannot provide that. The only one who can give living water is Jesus himself. In John 4, 13 and 14, he said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus Christ is that living water. You're thirsty and you try to find this, the quenching of your thirst in some religious system or through some false teaching, some false doctrine. But Jesus said, no, if you drink of that water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give to you, it'll spring up into you as a well of living water. And it's eternal life. He speaks of them as being clouds that are carried by, by a tempest. They're, they're mist that is driven by a storm. They have instability. They lack substance. Uh, a cloud is something that has, has no, no substance to it whatsoever. It's simply a mist. And, and say the farmer is looking out and, and the crops are dry and he sees these clouds and it seems that the wind is drifting them towards his pasture, but it turns out that it's just a mist. It's just mist driven by the wind. It's not going to provide the water that he needs. He says in verse 18, they speak great swelling words of emptiness and the allure through the lust of the flesh. Great swelling words speaks of extravagant statements, but their words are empty. They're devoid of truth. They're inappropriate. They're even depraved. Their preaching is shallow and their preaching content is empty because all they're trying to do is beguile by flattery and entice and deceive. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, it says concerning false teachers that they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. But they use licentiousness. They allure through unbridled lust. They bait through sexual sin very often. They may be enticing through greed. Many years ago, there was a group of people, and they're still around from what I understand, but not many in number, that were called at that time the children of God. They had a leader by the name of, gave himself the name, Moses David. Moses David used to send his followers into various places. I actually encountered children of God in Europe when I was there in 1975. They had traveled, many had traveled to Europe, and they were doing the same thing that they did here, and they used to be present in Hollywood quite often. 
And they would walk through the streets and they would speak to people. One of my friends who was a very good guitar player was actually on the streets there in Hollywood when the children of God came and basically seduced him and had him sell his guitar and everything he possessed and gave to them. And then he began to live with them in a communal kind of system, the children of God. And they were well known for being people who would come and seduce people and take them away and put them in their communes and all. But this guy who called himself Moses David wasn't getting enough converts. And so he began a system that was called flirty fishing. I used to have an entire bag filled with all the tracks from the children of God. And, and I remember reading of flirty fishing. And, and I had a woman I knew who used to be in our church who was part of the children of God. And she's the one who gave me all of these tracks. And she's the one who shared so much of this with me. She was there firsthand. And what they would do is they would get the young girls and send them out to the street. The young girls would pick up on the guys, seducing them sexually and bring them back to the house so that they could take these kids and they would begin to live with them in the communal system. They called it flirty fishing. But that, what, what the apostle is speaking of here, actually takes place in a literal way. They used their doctrine to seduce. And in this, they used licentiousness. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, Paul said, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Now it seems that their prey are those who have actually escaped from those who uh, who live in error. At one time, these were new believers. That, that, that They're targeting new believers. They're, they're wanting to take the new Christians who have yet to really be grounded in the word, and so they're more open to their propaganda. And what do they do? Well, he says in verse 19, they promise them liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So they're promising them freedom from restraint, but we need to understand that true liberty is living as we should, not as we please. And God hasn't called me to live an immoral life and to call that living by grace. But instead of freedom, what they become is slaves to corruption. The word corruption in an ethical sense is moral decay. It speaks of depravity. The fruit of their teaching is morally corrupt disciples. Promising freedom, but not being able to deliver. Notice, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Whatever it is that is your master passion, whatever is the chief love of your life, is your God and is your master. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. What you are known best by, in terms of the way that you live, in terms of your reputation, whatever you are known as is reflecting simply that which you love the most. So if somebody is describing you and they say, man, they know how to party, that simply is describing what your chief passion is. Man, that guy's a drunk. That's simply describing your master passion. Man, that guy's got a lot of stuff. He's a materialist. He's simply described by his master passion. That's why if somebody says that person's a real Christian, that's why that matters. That person's godly. That really matters. That person lives a holy life. That really matters. Because what is your master passion? Whatever it may be is going to be revealed by the way that you live. So whatever overcomes a man becomes their master, and you become a slave to that. God says, love me with all of your heart. Jesus says, uh, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And, and these are calls for us to, to love God and to be disciples. And, and, and if Jesus Christ becomes my master passion in my life, then people are going to know that. I think it's a good habit once in a while, if you're a parent, to kind of have a spiritual checkup by asking your kids what your master passion is. You see, ultimately, 
those of us who are parents, ultimately, we will go home to be with the Lord if we're believers. And, and somebody will stand up in a pulpit just like this or perhaps this pulpit and will say things about you or, in my case, they'll say things about me. My children will stand up one day should the Lord tarry and I go home to be with him. Um, and they will give a eulogy. They will speak concerning the father that they knew and all. And to me, it's a real important thing to, uh, to live a life that, that helps them not to have to lie about me when they come up here, to live in such a way that, that they say good things. And so there are times that you might want to have a time of conversation with your child or children and, and ask them that question, what is it about me that you know is the master passion of my life? What is it? Be honest and let me know because I'm doing a spiritual check right now and I'd like to know. I did that with my son Joseph a while back now. I asked him that question. I was sitting down with him in the front room and I said, son, I want to ask you something. I would like to ask you, what is my master passion? I would like to know what you perceive in me. What is it that is my chief heart desire? I want to know. And I sat back and I said, be honest. Because I want to have a checkup. Be honest. What is it? My son Joseph looked at me. And he said, you know, Dad, the one thing I know about you is you love Jesus Christ. I'd say, your master passion is Jesus Christ. And I said, good, you shall live, my son. You shall live. <laughs> I was blessed to hear that, I have to be honest with you, because I think it important that we, that we make sure that we're walking with Jesus. Listen, whatever overcomes you becomes your master. What is it? What are you known for? Your, your, your toys, your cool sound system, the way you dress, some physical material. What, what is it you're known for? Because all of us are known for something. If somebody went on your job site and took people aside and said, can you tell me about this person here? What are they all about? What is it? Tell me truthfully. I'm not going to tell anybody. This isn't on camera. I'm just interested wonder what kind of things our friends, our family, our neighbors would say about us. Some of those things wouldn't be true. Granted, there are things that people say that simply it's their observation and they're wrong. That isn't you at all. We understand that. But there's normally a kernel of truth somewhere in their statement. And those are the things that you grab hold of. And those are the things that you listen to. And those are the things that help you to do a spiritual checkup every once in a while. What is it that you're known for? What is it? Well, some people are in bondage to false doctrine. They become like what the teachers say they ought to be like. And the result of that is they're in a lost condition. They're overcome by their sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience? which leads to righteousness. He goes on in verse 20 through 22 and says, For if, after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. These false teachers became correctly acquainted with the gospel, but they did not become related to the God of the gospel. To demonstrate genuine conversion would have required that they abide in Jesus Christ. But... This verse reveals their true nature when it speaks of dogs and it speaks of pigs in verse 22. Dogs and pigs were regarded as unclean. And so this is a way of saying they have no relationship with God. They have a religious profession, 
They may even have a temporary outward appearance of change, but they're not converted to true faith in Christ. Somebody can change the way that they live and may even be a bit better than what they were before. But unless they've opened their hearts to the true, genuine gospel of Jesus Christ, any transition that takes place in their life is going to be temporary and it's not going to be complete. When you come to faith in Christ, Jesus Christ begins to work within you by his Holy Spirit. His word becomes your guide in life, your prayer language to him. You communicate to him things and he communicates back through his word and through promptings of his spirit and and you're changed for the better. And you do that in the morning. You do that the next morning. You do it the next morning. You have your devotional time where you pick up the Bible and you read through the books. You have your time of prayer. You get in your car and you drive somewhere and you put on Christian music. You put on teaching channels that teach you the word of God. And your life changes gradually, day by day, over a week, over a month, over a year, over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And over the years, you're not just growing up. Over the years, you're growing into maturity in Christ. Or you grab hold of a false teacher. He takes you in the wrong direction. By their fruit, you shall know them. False teachers have nothing to do with Jesus, the true Jesus. They present devised schemes and cunning declarations of their own hearts. They're convinced that those things are true, but they're dry wells. They can't provide for you spiritual life and water. That only comes through Jesus. And that comes when we bow our knee to him, confess our sin to him, ask him for forgiveness, and ask him to come into our life that we might become his temple, that we might be transformed because of him. That comes through the truth of the scripture that doesn't come through false teachers.